All right, guys, well, if you're here today, it's because you're learning about the late 1800s. And today we're going to really focus on the, uh, the land out west and a group of people known as the Native Americans. So let's get it going. Um, obviously, this right here is a, a picture of the Great Plains. If you see any of these great flatlands, uh, that, that is the Great Plains where the buffalo roamed. And a lot of the Great Plains natives relied on the buffalo for a food source, for clothing, to make their teepees. And they were nomadic and they, they followed those, those herds, right? Uh, what we have here is we have a bunch of pioneers who are, you know, you got their Conestoga wagons and they're making their way to the west. And right there, as they make it out of the Appalachian Mountains through the Ohio River Valley, what are they going to see? The Great Plains, right? So Frederick Jackson Turner in 1893, so this is really the late 1800s, actually wrote a significant essay. Uh, it was his thesis or his theory. And he said that the frontier had a significance on the American, uh, on our history, on our culture, uh, on who we are, right? Um, the frontier, the advancement, the, the continuation to the West, uh, really advanced American settlement and explained our development. Our development was always, hey, we're, we're, we're moving out, there's new opportunities. So life in the West given rise to a couple different things. First of all, inventiveness. Uh, people had to invent uh, new things, especially Joseph Glidden's barbed wire, to survive and make it out west. There was a sense of independence, where if you moved out there, you may be on your own and you had to really fend for yourself. And the other situation is, he referred to it as a safety valve, meaning that if you really weren't making it in the east, you could always move out west and get a fresh start. It was a way to get a uh, kind of a new beginning for some people. The way I look at it is, if you were a loser in the East, you could move out to the West and you can make something of yourself. But the only issue here in the late 1890s, Frederick Jackson really writes about is, the frontier will close. So the, the idea of having that safety valve or having that fresh beginning is going to be gone in the late 1800s. It's around in the 1860s, 1870s, but by, you know, turn of the century, by 1900, we aren't going to have it anymore. So just giving you a quick little timeline of the American West. These are certain events that you should know. And if you don't know these events, these are events you certainly want to look up, all right? So early on, the Homestead Act gave people 160 acres and uh, forced me really, like, made people want to move out there. I mean, it was an incentive for people to move out there. So you had a, a bunch of the Native American Wars, the Dawes Act, if you're taking an American history class, you have to know the Dawes Act was the American government's way of forcing the Native Americans to assimilate series of Native American battles that they lose and kind of the late 1890s is the, kind of the end of uh, what's really happening out west. So let's take a look at Native Americans and early westward expansion. So westward expansion in the late 1800s is going to create some problems. Problems for who? Native Americans. Why? White settlers continue to move further and further west. Up until the 1860s, really, uh, white settlement only ended up going up to around the Mississippi River. Well, after the Civil War, there's incredible amounts of people who continue to flood past the Mississippi, which means problems for the natives, right? Scattered groups of Native Americans lived in the east by the 1840s. The majority of them had been forced to move west around the 1830s, 1840s, during the Jacksonian period, all right? So few groups uh, are in the east, but most of the Native Americans are going to live west of the Mississippi River on lands the white people in the early 1800s didn't really want. Well, after the Civil War, as white people continue to move out there, uh, they're going to encroach on more and more Native American land. So we'll give you some reasons. Uh, why, why did the white people begin moving west onto those lands? Well, a couple of reasons, right? Number one, 1848-49, you're looking at the California Gold Rush. So trails develop. People start making their way out there in droves, and they're going to start settling in California. And they're going to be cutting right through Native American lands. In the 1860s, uh, late 1860s, we finished the Transcontinental Railroad, and therefore, now we have quick access to get from east to west. And then where that picture I showed you with all those roaming buffalo, well, the Great Plains, that was all Native American lands, but once we find out that that's good uh, farmland, we're going to want to go out there and take it, which means... 
problems for Native Americans. So I'll take you through a series of uh, Native American wars here. This right here is one of the early trails, right, to get out west, right? Um, and obviously along here you have Temple's Cove, Independence Rock. You have little cities developing along these trails, right? Uh, this right here would be the first transcontinental railroad. The Union Pacific left Omaha, Nebraska and began building westward. The Central Pacific left Sacramento and began you know, moving that eastward. They met at Promontory Point in Utah, drove in the Golden Spike, and now we have the transcontinental railroad. You can travel all the way across the country. But this is the issue right here. It's cutting right through Native American lands, right? So, series of Indian Wars. Uh, right around uh, the Civil War time period, from the 1850s to the 1890s, there's a series of wars out west against the Native Americans. The Natives will fight back, they'll have a few victories, but in the end they're probably going to lose, right? Gradually, each Native American group was forced to accept treaties, which put them onto reservations. Let me see that. Native American resistance, why was it weak? Why could the Native Americans not win these wars? While so many number of whites continued to move out there, it was like an, an onslaught, they just kept coming. Uh, the white people had superior technology in terms of weaponry and trains, where the Native Americans, they, they had some guns, but still they're relying on, you know, horseback and bow and arrow. Uh, and the Native Americans, uh, there were many different groups out west, so they really didn't band together. There was inner wars between them all. If they did band together, it would be an interesting story to see what, what happened. So. Uh, the defeat of the Sioux and Wounded Knee, late 1800s, 1890, is considered by most historians as the end of the Indian Wars. After that, there's going to be no more major Indian uprising. There'll still be a, a Native American movement to gain equal rights, but there won't be any real fighting. All right. Uh, so what you have here is a nice map of all the major Native American wars in the 1890s. So there's your cutoff point right there, 1890. And you start to see those major battles, right? The Massacre, Battle of Little Bighorn, uh, Battle of Wounded Knee, which is the last one, the Sand Creek Massacre. If you're taking an American history class, you should know that one. So that's what's kind of going on right there in the, uh, the late 1800s, all right? So if you don't know the, the vocabulary or you need it, you might want to pick that up and then pause that so you got it, right? Now, what I did for you here is prepare just a little chart so you can keep in mind all of the Native American War. So uh, right at the end of the Civil War, federal government decides to build a road through the Sioux Territory while well, that led to uh, warring with the, the Sioux Nation, right? 1867, Red Cloud, uh, Red Cloud's War ends. The Sioux agreed to live on the reservations over in the Dakota Territory, South Dakota and the Black Hills. You know why uh, the, the American government sent them to the Black Hills? Of course, because there was no good farmland there, right? <clears throat> but uh, the federal government allowed miners to search for gold in those Black Hills on their reservation. Then the Second Sioux War begins. Chief Sitting Bull leads many Sioux off the reservation. So at the Battle of Little Bighorn, Sitting Bull's warriors destroy Custer's army. In response, the federal government sent a whole bunch of troops out there. Most Sioux were like, no way, we're done, man. They agree to move on to reservations, which is kind of sad. Um, at the Massacre of Wounded Day, American soldiers opened fire on a bunch of unarmed Sioux, killing 200. What the Sioux were doing at Wounded Knee were trying to get back to their, their tribal way. Um, they were doing this thing called a ghost dance, and the American Army thought they were they were up to no good. So what do you do? You start shooting. So that's kind of like the, the, the end of the Sioux in 1890, and they say, hey, whatever you want us to do, we'll do. So we're going to look at some changing policies here. The federal government continued to display very little understanding or respect for Native American cultures or values. Right. So what they did was they said, hey, just move on to these reservations. The problem was the reservation lands really couldn't support the people who were living on those reservations. It wasn't really good farmland. So the federal government attempted to do something else. I say attempted, I say tried, because this does not work. So when we get it, it is known as the Dawes Act. And that is in 1887, the federal government tried to assimilate Native Americans. All right. Uh, what's assimilation? Similarization is to make similar, similar. So if you see that word, think of similar. Well, what does that mean? They wanted to Americanize the Native Americans. Just make them act like white people. 
Well, how do you do that? You break up the tribes, you put families on individual plots and say, hey, you're going to farm this 160 acres, you're going to pay taxes, you're going to dress like white people, you're going to be like white people. Well, this is not going to work, by the way, right? Few Native Americans really accepted these terms. The federal government gave up and said, hey, if you want to be Native American, continue to do that, but we're going to put you on these small reservations. Right? But during the Dawes Act, they set up forced acculturation, forcing the white culture on Native American children. And that is happening at what's known as the Carlisle Indian School. Uh, and if you were in my class, I know we took a good look at some pictures, right? So this is the, the little reservations that are set up after the 1890s, after the Dawes Act fails. And that, that kind of gives you uh, an idea of the, the Dawes Act, right? These are Native American children, and these here are the same Native American children. We're going to make you dress like white people, cut your hair, act like white people, speak English, and uh, that was what the federal government wanted to do. So if you need a civilization, uh, I'm sorry, assimilation, you got it there. Um, and there's a question at the end, so we'll let you uh, take care of that question. We look forward to seeing you next time.